Well, um, welcome. A um, little bit about my background. I'm a senior studying here at BGSU um, with a double major in psychology and English. And I'm really interested in the use of mindfulness in yoga techniques as healthy coping skills. And I've done a couple of research projects about the effects of mindfulness in yoga for college student um, populations. And so today's talk, um, I'm really happy to be able to share um, some insight about mindfulness and um, how we can maybe start to incorporate it into a leadership context. So I am, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen. I wanted you all to be able to see me first before I did that. Okay, awesome. Here we go. So today's talk is entitled Theory and Practice, How to Use Mindfulness to Enhance Leadership. And if you've been attending the other really cool sessions in this conference so far, you probably know that your cameras are off and you are muted, but there is a Q&A um, section where you can send questions to me and I will be sure to check those at the end. Um, and then also the very last slide, I will provide my email address. So if you wanted to continue exploring this really fascinating conversation about mindfulness, there is a way to reach me. And I'm also happy to share these slides with you because I will be citing some research and a um, couple slides at the end. I think there were 17 references that if you wanted to go back and actually like find those papers for yourself, um, you can maybe try to take a screenshot here if it comes up on your device or if you just like to have the PowerPoint, you can email me and I would happily send that. All right, so today's presentation uh, will provide the definition, background, and current conceptualization of mindfulness. I know that this is kind of a buzzword right now and has been for the last probably like 10 years, but it's really starting to come to the foreground, especially on a college campus. And so I wanted to start off with defining and giving the historical context of the term and then understanding how researchers are using mindfulness um, here in 2020. We'll then move on to discuss the relationship between stress and mindfulness, review some recent research regarding positive implications of mindfulness-based interventions. Um, you'll see this acronym MBI stands for mindfulness-based interventions, uh, which could encompass things like a college course, um, a whole class you can take about mindfulness, maybe a specific uh, workshop, four week, six week workshop is something that's really common. Uh, and even something as simple as like this presentation, um, we'll be doing some mindfulness activities. Uh, it's not quote unquote, like an intervention where it's long term, but mindfulness activities that are incorporated um, in higher education kind of fall under this umbrella term of MBI. So just so you're aware of that, I'll be using that term here. We'll do three uh, mindfulness activities, which is kind of exciting, a little break in the middle of the presentation. And then we'll wrap up by reviewing the five facets of mindfulness and leaving you with some ideas of maybe how you can start to reflect on your own leadership development, specifically using these five facets. And then of course, a whole couple of slides full of references. So starting off, what is mindfulness? It originated from the Eightfold Path of Buddhism. So the practice of mindfulness is very, very, very ancient. Uh, it has been around for a long time. Um, recently, more within like the last 30 to 40 years, it has started to be integrated into Western culture, modern Western medical models even. Um, but the important thing here is I think we always need to acknowledge roots of practices, um, where they come from, where they started. Um, but you do not have to be a Buddhist to be able to practice mindfulness or be able to incorporate it into your life. But it is still important to acknowledge where it comes from. And if you do um, identify as Buddhist and use mindfulness in other ways, that's also welcome. But just acknowledging where it comes from. So currently, as I mentioned, um, mindfulness is accepted as a secular practice of contemplative inquiry. So that's another way for us to start to be able to define this term. 
and this definition is the most widely cited definition of mindfulness. It comes from John Cabot Zinn, who is the founder of Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, which is the first program to start to be able to implement mindfulness in a Western medical model. And his definition is that mindfulness is paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. And you'll see some of these words come back um, a little bit later when we start exploring the five facets of mindfulness. So in all, mindfulness is a tool um, where, that we can use to practice attending to an experience completely as it is unfolding and happening in the moment, exactly as it is. Based on this, we can use mindfulness as a way to shift our conceptual framework of a situation. So we might have been hearing, at least I hear a lot, that mindfulness can be used for stress reduction, which it might be a useful tool for that. Um, and the way that this happens is we start to reframe our experiences to start to work with emotions or situations instead of trying to work against them, which actually just exasperates the feelings of stress or the feelings of anxiety and things that can't be controlled. I do have a mindful jar here. I'm going to try to leave this the screen share and come back and show you. Uh, but I'm going to show you a visual representation of mindfulness and what it does uh, with our brains under stress. So we're going to remember here that the jar, like a mason jar, right, uh, is going to represent your mind. And this jar is full of water and glitter. The glitter represents emotions, experiences, feelings, thoughts, or really this can just be summed up as saying life, right? Life experiences, all the things that are happening out in the world, like pandemics and elections and schoolwork and finals and all that amazing, challenging, <laughs> interesting stuff um, is represented here by the glitter. So let's see, let's see. I'm gonna stop share, awesome. Hopefully you can see this. I'm not sure how well it's going to work <laughs> in Zoom, um, but here's our jar. And the, I do acknowledge there's a glare from the windows. I tried to like move my stuff around and couldn't, couldn't get the glare to completely go away. Um, but we do have this jar here. It's full of orange water representing VG and uh, some brown glitter, which is always fun. And so here, for the most part, and I get you can't really see it that well. Um, when the jar is settled, can you see, I know you can't answer me, but you can see the pen on through the other side of the jar, right? You know that I'm holding something on the other end. So this jar represents our minds and we're content, just kind of like an ordinary, regular old day. We can see clearly through our minds, right? We can see through the other side. We know that there's a pen on the other side of this jar. When something starts to get stressful, when we're maybe experiencing a conflict um, with a roommate or stress about an exam or any of the other big things that are happening in the world, that's represented here as I start to shake the jar. So shaking the jar, now we look here. I'm holding the pen behind it and cannot see the pen through the other side. Um, it's hard to see clearly <laughs> through this jar when our thoughts, emotions, uh, really challenging experiences are clouding the mind. And so as you, that's stress, right? That's, that's life. As we set the jar down and kind of take a break, kind of take a step back from everything that's going on, um, we start to see, and it's going to be really challenging for you, I'm imagining, there's like a little bit of a break up here where we can see like the white bubbles and then some clearing starting to happen at the top. And then down here, we see it's a little bit more thicker with, the, with that glitter as it's starting to settle. This um, step back is representative of mindfulness, using mindfulness as our tool to take a step away from the situation still notice what's happening. We didn't take anything out of the jar. We didn't dump the glitter out. All of the high stress challenges are still present. They're still with us, but we are changing our relationship to them. And so now um, we can see the pen. Oh yeah, I can see it on my end. You can see the pen um, through the other side at the top. And then when I move the pen down, it's a little bit darker. That's where all that glitter still is and you can't really see it. So <laughs> hopefully that turned out okay on your end. Um, 
really the main takeaway is we can use mindfulness to help us cope with challenges. And it's a lot easier to start to work with your emotions in situations rather than trying to work against them. So when that glitter was shaken all around and the jar was all over the place, it was a little bit harder to see clearly through, to make sound decisions, to maybe make big leadership decisions. Whereas when we started to maybe take a deep breath, reorient our surroundings, um, change our framework, we can start to allow that glitter to settle and work with our situations. So I like to use the mindful jar just as a way um, to give a, a visual representation of what mindfulness is doing or what it can help us with in our minds. All right, so I'm gonna go back to my screen share. Awesome. So yes, as a reminder, these were the representations here. We'll move on. So the integration of MBIs or mindfulness-based interventions um, within a college campus. So the inclusion of mindfulness training for college students specifically has been really helpful, um, has shown to be helpful in research studies, specifically because this is a transition period uh, as young adults start to become more adjusted to the college life. Mindfulness practices have started to be implemented within college campuses um, in various ways. I mentioned a couple of these earlier, uh, specifically the student affairs services via health initiatives, also available at counseling centers, different training programs, and even some college classes that may be taken for course credit. Here specifically at BG, um, I, there, I know that there is one mindfulness class now this semester. It's a one credit hour PEG class um, where you learn mindfulness skills and kind of reflect on the different activities. And then previous years, there have been three credit hour classes, uh, specifically in the social work department and another one in the family and consumer sciences uh, department where it was a practice-based course and you learn the mindfulness skills um, practice mindfulness meditation and got course credit for it, which is super cool. Um, also here, I don't know if you've heard of, they may, they have the program called Focused Falcon, um, which is a partnership between the Wellness Connection and the Counseling Center, uh, where it's a four week workshop. It's pretty cool. Uh, it's free um, for BGSU um, students, staff and faculty, where someone from the Counseling Center practices mindfulness activities with you. You do a little bit of introspection, a little bit of reflection, and you do receive a journal and a book to kind of help you um, with along those four weeks. And so definitely look into that. They've been doing that for the last year and a half and they have really good turnout. And it's all online, it's all on Zoom um, this semester, which is a cool, cool way to think about if you're interested in learning more about mindfulness, there's an opportunity for you there too. So as we can see, I just listed a couple uh, places here on our campus where mindfulness is being implemented. There's also a peer education program specifically through the wellness connection um, that I helped create over the last year just to provide activities and to provide a space for students to be able to practice mindfulness and learn how it can be useful um, and how it can also be challenging in, in coping and the adjustment to college. So these citations here will be from research studies um, of other college campuses and university initiatives, but we also have it going on here too, which is kind of neat. Definitely a buzzword, right? Okay, so going off of the effects of some of these MBIs, we've seen that mindfulness, very broadly defined, um, has shown reductions in psychological signs of stress. So this can include self-reported stress by college students, um, symptoms of anxiety or depression. Also helps to alleviate physiological symptoms of stress. So this would include blood pressure, heart rates, respiration rate, and even some cool studies where they take uh, levels of cortisol and seeing a reduction in cortisol samples through saliva. There's also been some research showing that mindfulness leads to an implicit awareness of multiple perspectives. I think this would be most interesting for us here, trying to think about how to incorporate mindfulness or why it might be useful in a leadership role. 
It also helps people become aware and open to new information or new perspectives. Enhances one's ability to be aware of context sensitivity. Results in an increase in present moment orientation and promotes active listening skills. And so majority of the citations at the end of this presentation are from this slide. Uh, we see we almost have 10 of them here about the potential effects on psychological health, um, physiological health, and then leadership um, skills or things that could be really useful in our development as, as leaders across campus and beyond. Awesome. So that was a very brief, super quick background of where mindfulness comes from, um, how it's currently conceptualized, and why it is potentially useful. Uh, like I said, mindfulness is really a buzzword on college campuses, uh, but I think it's because this is a place for people to start to learn appropriate grounding and coping skills uh, that can be utilized throughout their college career and beyond. And so I wanted to provide an opportunity to practice mindfulness, if this is a new idea or a new concept to you, um, please feel free to participate in any way that feels comfortable and useful for you today. So maybe you choose to just listen or maybe jot some notes uh, down or maybe you do actively engage in the activity. Um, there will be three of them. And it's also important to acknowledge that mindfulness exercises are going to have different effects for everyone. And so what is conducive and useful to me for stress reduction or for present moment orientation might be really challenging and difficult for somebody else. And so that's something to remember for yourselves as, you're, as we're moving through these practices. Um, and also knowing that something that works for you one day might not work for you the next. And so just being open, open to present experience in a non-judgmental way, which is really like the definition of mindfulness. So the first exercise here is deep equal ratio breathing. The most common example of a mindfulness exercise would be breath awareness. Um, the breath is the only, the only thing that's really ever only happening in the present moment, right? We can't take a past breath and we cannot take a future breath. Um, so we're only ever breathing in the present moment. And so one way to help if we are feeling stressed, if we, here's my jar, oh, all the glitter has settled. I don't know how well you can see this, but all the glitter has, has settled back down. But when we shake up that jar and it's hard to see through um, and make sound decisions, one way to kind of step back and, and anchor ourselves into the body might be to gain awareness of your breath. And so if you'd like to participate in this activity, I invite you now to start to notice how you're sitting. Notice where you're sitting or where you're standing. Just starting to find connection between yourself and your environment. If it feels safe and okay, you might start to lower your gaze out towards the tip of your nose or else maybe allowing your eyes to softly close all the way. But knowing that if you do choose to close your eyes, you may open them at any time for any reason. And as you start to come into awareness of your surroundings, start to shift that awareness to your internal state. One way to do this would be bringing attention to your breath. Not quite changing your breath just yet, but seeing if you can notice your breath in this moment. Maybe noticing if you're breathing in and out through your nose or maybe your mouth. Seeing also Something maybe like the temperature of the air as it passes into and out through your nose or your mouth. Another way to start to bring awareness to your breath is maybe by noticing how far it's traveling or where it's traveling in your body. 
So as you breathe in, maybe noticing where else you feel movement in your body. And as you breathe out, noticing where you feel a change in your body. If you like to stay here, just simply noticing how you're naturally breathing, you may. Or if you'd like, uh, you can start to find an equal ratio breath pattern. So this can be done by taking a conscious inhale through your nose for maybe a count of three, four, or five. And when you're ready to exhale, gently releasing the air back out through your nose for a matched count of three, four, or five. I'm starting to continue with this equal ratio breathing. Choosing your pace and the depth of your breath. Maybe it's useful to place one hand over your heart and the other hand on top of your belly and see if you can tune into the felt sense of the rise and the fall of your body as you're breathing in and as you're breathing out. We'll stay here for one more repetition wherever you are, taking your time to complete your inhale with your matched exhale, and then allowing your breath to return to its natural rhythm. And before we move on, just taking a moment to notice any thoughts or feelings or sensations that practice brought up for you and seeing if you can meet those sensations with a, a feeling of openness, open awareness, not judging anything. So that was deep equal ratio breathing. There is one more breath technique I wanted to share because it is quite simple and useful that you can apply to other situations. Um, it's called the hand breath. So hopefully you can see my hand. <laughs> You'll be spreading, um, opening your palm wide. And with this one, very similar to what we just did with deep equal ratio breath, but taking the opposite finger, the uh, finger on the opposite hand and you'll trace your open palm. And on the inhale, you'll trace, say I'm starting on my thumb. So you'll inhale as you trace up your thumb. And as you exhale, start to trace down the thumb. Inhale, tracing up your pointer finger. Exhale as you trace back down and moving all the way um, through all of your fingers. Um, I like this one. I like to offer this one because it gives this felt sense of connection. You're tracing your hand. You can watch yourself as you're tracing your hand, um, or if you want to keep your eyes closed, you can do that too. And then if you do five seconds of five count breaths, so inhaling for five, exhaling for five, up um, all five fingers, and then around the palm, um, that ends up being a full one minute. Uh, and so if you're trying to come up with ways or grounding techniques and one minute of deep breathing, but you don't want to set a timer and you don't want to be checking your phone, you kind of just need a break. This is one way to keep time for yourself. Um, five seconds up and down each finger and then around the palm. So we won't, we're kind of short on time today, so we won't necessarily practice that one, but I just wanted to share it um, as another tool for you to potentially utilize. Okay, so the second mindfulness opportunity we have today is gratitude practice. 
So I'm going to invite you to take a few moments to consciously practice gratitude. Gratitude is considered a mindfulness exercise um, as it is a specific type of contemplative inquiry where we're focusing our attention to a specific thing and then noting the role of the importance of that thing in your life. And so we'll have um, just a few minutes, maybe, maybe two or three minutes here um, where I will invite you as an opportunity um, to maybe journal or maybe just jot down on a piece of paper or a little sticky note, post-it notes. Maybe you wanted to make a note in your phone or type out on your computer or maybe even just think in your mind. You don't necessarily need to write anything down, um, but just starting to notice what you're grateful for today, specifically today. Um, and to help get you started, I do have some prompts on this next slide. So if you wanted to look here, you don't need to write about everything on here. You don't need to write about anything on here, um, but just some ideas for, for gratitude prompts. I think it can be really easy, especially when our minds look like that really clouded jar and it's hard to see clear. Um, it's super hard to practice gratitude um, when we're feeling stressed or working through a lot of challenges, um, but there's always something, somewhere, somehow um, that, that at least I can find to be able to connect to. Um, and so this is a useful skill um, and something that I think we don't talk about enough or that we don't, we don't incorporate enough. So I will <laughs> be quiet now for the next uh, three minutes. We'll do three minutes um, so that you can, if you like to journal or give some thought to any of these prompts and noticing maybe why you're grateful for these things or whatever comes to mind. Perhaps also noting how your life might be different if this thing or this person or experience didn't exist or happen. Or another way to think about this is where in your body can you feel a sense of gratitude if you can feel it in your body? Okay, so we will start to end this activity. We know that you can always come back to this um, at another time. I know this was pretty quick, um, but starting to think of other ways where you can maybe incorporate gratitude practice into your day um, might be another way to start to practice more mindfulness. And our third activity is called Open Senses. And so if we refer back to uh, John Kabat-Zinn's definition of mindfulness, the 
we have that um, present moment experience, um, openness to awareness, non-judgmentally. And so one way to start to immerse yourself, we've done a couple of internal activities, right? The acknowledging of your breath, gratitude practice. Um, this mindfulness activity is a little bit more externally focused. It is a guided script, so I will be reading off of a script for you. Um, and again, if you would like a copy of this script, you can email me and I would be happy to send it to you. Um, so this will be a few minutes if you're interested in, in participating and open senses. You can start off by finding a comfortable um, seated upright position, or if you are standing, standing up tall, but not too rigid. Allowing your body to feel supported by whatever um, surface is beneath you, maybe feeling your feet on the floor, or maybe noticing your hips in the chair. Maybe your back is resting against a wall or the chair. If you like, the eyelids may start to close, perhaps all the way, or else finding a soft focus point where your eyes can rest. So maybe looking away from the computer. And as you follow along in this practice, you may get distracted, bored, or your mind might start to wander off. And if that happens, that's okay. Gently notice that it's happening and bring your attention back to sensing your current environment. So that's useful, a useful technique or outcome of mindfulness is when we notice that our mind is starting to wander or when we notice that our mind is starting to look like the, the shaken jar, we can note what's happening and start to set our attention back, see if we can see the whole picture. This mindfulness practice will lead you through your senses to come into contact with your current environment and experience. So please modify the practice to best suit your needs um, to honor any sensory challenges you might have. Starting with sight, keeping the same body posture, allow your eyes to softly open if they were closed and settle your gaze onto an object in your space. No need to think too much about it. Just notice where your eyes are drawn to and then allow your gaze to gently rest on this object. As you observe this object with your sense of sight, notice the different features you are able to see. Notice without judgment how the light looks on the object. Notice any patterns or textures that might be present here. Really look at this object as if you have never seen it before. Allowing your gaze to follow along the edges, shapes, colors, and patterns. You may notice your mind start to label or compare what you see to other things in your mind. And if this judgment starts to happen, gently notice and bring your mind back to simply observing with your eyes. For another few moments, continue to notice this object in entirety. Now allowing your eyes to softly close or your gaze might settle down towards your lap. As you start to shift your mindful awareness to your sense of touch. Without expectation, gently scan through your body and notice any physical sensations. You might notice your clothes on your skin. Maybe you feel the pressure of your body resting, wherever you may be resting. Doing your best to stay relatively still, yet breathing comfortably. And notice any subtle physical sensations. Maybe you notice the temperature in your body. Is it the same everywhere? Or maybe you notice any areas of tightness or stiffness. 
And if you happen to come into contact with any difficult or uncomfortable sensation, do your best to observe this experience with patience and kindness. And if something feels too overwhelming, notice that sensation and then gently start to guide your awareness to a safer sensation. For another few moments, continue to notice And now shifting your awareness as best as you can to your sense of hearing. As you sit in your space, notice any sounds that are present. Doing your best to just listen with a sense of curiosity and openness. Not necessarily reaching for sounds, but instead just noticing what sound vibrations make their way to your ears. If you notice any noise, maybe you start to become aware of tones, patterns, or rhythms. You might also notice the volume. Wondering where in the space the noise is coming from. And if your mind tries to label the sound or if it starts to think and analyze the sound, do your best to let that go and redirect your attention to simply listening and noticing the sensation of hearing. If there are voices in your space, try to focus on how it feels to hear the sound rather than thinking about the content of the words. For another few moments, continue to breathe as you notice any sounds that might be present in your space. Now start to shift your awareness to your sense of smell. As you begin to notice the sensation of smell, what scents are in your environment? Perhaps there is a strong scent in your space. Notice where in your nose you sense the smell. Maybe you're noticing a lack of scent in your space. Simply notice the lack of sensation of smell in your nose. Bringing your awareness to how your sense of smell is different on the inhale compared to the exhale. Observe if maybe one nostril might feel more open than the other. Continuing to keep your awareness here. And if your mind begins to wander or starts to judge your experience, gently notice that it may be happening. And then bring your focus back to a place of openness and curiosity. Continuing to breathe and notice the sense of smell in your space. And lastly, bringing your awareness to the sense of taste. Perhaps you move the tongue around a little or swallow once or twice, noticing any sensations of taste right now. Maybe noticing any lingering flavors from food or beverages that you consumed recently. Perhaps noticing toothpaste flavor left in your mouth. If you do notice a taste, where do you sense that taste in your mouth? It, all, it is also possible that you may not notice any taste at all. If that's true, you're still practicing noticing the absence of taste. Sometimes as we're practicing guiding our awareness to different senses, there can be a lot to take in in our environment. And sometimes there is not. 
For one more moment, continue to breathe as you notice the sensation of taste. Gently starting to bring your awareness back to your natural breath. Becoming aware of each in-breath and each out-breath. Feel and experience yourself in the space you are currently in. Starting to make small movements in the fingers and the toes, maybe moving the muscles in the face and growing those movements. Maybe shifting in your space. And then when you feel ready, slowly begin to open your eyes or bring your focus back to your device, maybe your phone or your computer, all while keeping the mindful awareness of your senses in this space. Okay, well, welcome back. So that was the guided open senses mindfulness activity. So I just led us through three different mindfulness activities that I thought were most conducive to a virtual environment um, and were able to foster some introception for you to be able to tune into your own experience, your own internal experience, and then also the last one where you could become mindful of your external environment. Um, but please know that there are so many different mindfulness activities um, available. There's like a quick Google search or um, I do have some book recommendations that um, I can show you at the end with lots of different mindfulness activities. So this is just a little bit of a taste of how you can practice mindfulness um, in a quick and a short term kind of mindfulness break snack break type of <laughs> type of work other than doing like a full mindfulness you know one hour meditation so how can you use these activities um spe specifically in the context of leadership well for one maybe using mindfulness activities as icebreakers for your group um especially um as a way to start to provide like, practical tools for your um, group, the people that you work with, people that you're leading with, um, that they can take with them and utilize in other situations. So we all probably know what it's like to race from meeting to meeting in a college campus, or nowadays it's like logging on to the right online platform and making sure you have the right Zoom link. And sometimes we are changing pace super, super fast. Um, and so maybe starting your group session um, with a mindfulness activity can help bring people into their bodies, into their space, getting them ready to focus and be present for whatever um, presentation you or topic you are going to review with them um, might be a useful, a useful way to start to incorporate mindfulness. Another idea could be using breaks throughout meetings. And so I purposely put the activities in the center of our presentation today because I know that Zoom fatigue is very real and, you know, staring at a computer all day can really strain the eyes. And so it's easier, I think, to become distracted, especially in an online environment. The uh, availability to or the urge to want to multitask is here, even like not only in other documents, but also in other things in the house, like, oh, I can go do my laundry and still have the lecture going. And so incorporating these mindfulness activities as breaks throughout meetings can help um, bring people back to the space and give them a break if, if they need one. Also group bonding, um, things like there's a, an exercise called mindful listening um, where you're put into pairs and someone has three or five minutes to talk about a prompt or just to free speak. And the other person is not supposed to interrupt, um, just listen mindfully um, with attention and awareness and openness and non-judgment and then reflect back anything that they heard at the end of the five minutes and then you switch sides. Um, it can be really easy to say that we're listening but to be listening mindfully is a whole, is a whole different uh, skill whole different skill set and so to enhance group bonding and also for skills that you can utilize in other experiences that's one way to use mindfulness and then lastly for your own personal practice um, enhancing your ability to be present and to make uh, appropriate judgments um, 
in acting as a leader. You don't want your jar to be all shaken up all the time when we have a lot of things going on. And so utilizing the uh, facets of mindfulness to be able to take a step back can help ground yourself too. Okay, and kind of as a segue with that, um, one of the last things I wanted to bring up were the five facets of mindfulness. And so one way that researchers are conceptualizing mindfulness is by looking at these five facets. And so these are like the outcomes of a mindfulness practice. And these all correspond to your role as a leader. And so just as a way, um, running out of time, so we won't have time to go through each of these individually, um, but I do want to, I did want to show you this screen. Um, so you can see asking yourself, how am I purposefully acting with awareness as I'm you know, leading my peers or in leadership roles. Also then being able to describe and observe um, your environment. We did that in the open senses activity. Why is this useful? You know, think to yourself, why is being able to observe and describe what's going on around me um, important in my role as a leader? And then these um, points three and four, non-judging of inner experience and non-reactivity to inner experience. So you as a leader, um, maybe taking a moment to jot down some notes or think about this at a later time. Why is it important uh, not to judge your own reactions? I mean, we're all going to have reactions all the time, but especially in, in a leadership setting. And why is it important to not react to your immediate um, experience or your immediate emotions um, because as we saw earlier it's a little bit harder to see clearly through the jar when we are reacting to high stress situations so be able to take a step back and continue in our role um, can help us be the most the most effective leaders Okay, so our wrap up points here. MBIs or mindfulness based interventions um, are utilized throughout college campuses and have shown positive benefits for mental, emotional, and physical well being of students. So, because of that, um, we're seeing more mindfulness initiatives being, being included on campus. One way that we can also start to include uh, mindfulness activities would be through group meetings, um, and this can help foster group cohesion maybe a sense of feeling grounded or prepared or <laughs> aware and alert and ready to be active participants of a group. And then also providing tools to successfully manage stress. Your students or your peers can use these tools in other, in other ways outside of your meeting or outside of the activity that you started your meeting with. And lastly, as leaders, um, I do encourage you to ask yourself how you are adhering to or maybe ways that you can start to utilize those five facets of mindfulness. So that way you can start to hold a space where you are open, aware, and non-judgmental, um, which will ultimately help you lead as effectively as possible. I mentioned I do have these reference slides. If you wanted to take a quick screenshot, you could. This is some really awesome material um, if you're interested in reading about mindfulness, specifically in higher education is what all these references are for, or I can email this to you later. Um, this was one slide, and then this is the second if you wanted to save them now. And then lastly, uh, I do acknowledge there's only one more <laughs> saved a minute. Um, if you have any questions, please, 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 I'd love to hear from you. Um, email me here, or there is the Q&A Zoom feature. Let me stop sharing so I can find that if anyone has sent anything. But other than that, I thank you all so much for your attendance, and I hope that this presentation was useful to you. Um, yes, oh, thank you, Bridget. <laughs> yeah, if you have any any questions, feel free to reach out. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this conference, this super cool virtual conference, and have a peaceful rest of your weekend. Bye, everyone.